I'm really kind of a backwards lawyer. Um, I, I'm going to talk about all the lawyer stuff. I'll talk about the law and things like that. But I'm going to talk about a lot of backwards things that you don't hear about in divorce too, like success and opportunity and healing and creating, which are backwards. That's not the way we're normally used to think about divorce. And hopefully it'll become evident as we talk about why I think that kind of backward thinking is, is a good idea. And I'm pretty comfortable with that backward thinking here because in some ways Daisy Camp is kind of a backwards place because this isn't supposed to be happening. You're not supposed to get together and divorce and support each other and talk about your future and vision in a positive way. I mean, the old way of looking at divorce was we would sort of cower and talk about it quietly and treat it as this great tragedy that nobody knew what to do about. Well, of course, as you know, I mean, there, that's the old way of doing things. The new way is to really look at this in, and think about what you can do to build a better lives for yourselves, whatever your situation is. And, and so I, I think, as you all know, I mean, backwards really is forward today. And I really am glad to be here and glad to hope give you the, the tools you need to help you plan a better way. Here's my great diagram. This is as much, as much drawing as you'll see from me, thankfully, because uh, I'm not an artist. But it, what, what it shows is this is just kind of intended to show you know, what, when people describe what their lives have been like before they show up in my office, before the divorce, it's kind of the usual ups and downs and this and that. And then they're here. I mean, they're at this divorce spot, which is a really sad, hard spot. I mean, people talk about divorce being one of the, the crucial, difficult times. There's no point, no question that people are generally in a lot of pain here. And it's what happens here that's been interesting to me as I talk to people 5 and 10 and 15 years later. And, and you can put them in all sorts of categories, but mostly, they, for the most part, they fall into three general categories. And I've talked to people enough afterwards, I feel pretty confident in this. There are some people who this really was, you know, it just never got better. They really felt victimized and they wound up feeling victimized and never really healed. And, and it really, you know, you talk to them 10, 15 years later and they're not in very good shape. There are other people who, you know, it was kind of down, but kind of life went kind of back to where it was. And I guess it kind of it went back to the ups and downs. Things didn't change very much. They got through the experience, but life afterwards was pretty much like life was before. And then there's these people who somehow saw this as an opportunity and somehow said, well, okay, now, you know, things are where they're at. What can I do to better myself? And really, I talked to them 10, 15, 20 years later, and their lives are better than they were before and better than they had imagined. And when I talked to those people, most of the people would acknowledge, and I would observe that the decisions they made while they were at this process made a big difference as to whether they were on this line, this line, or this line. Now, if you were to ask me, you know, what is the, as I observed, what is sort of the secret, if you will? What is the difference that people do that wind up here versus here and here? And there's a lot of different things, but I think if I were to sum it up, and, and I, would, I would come down to you know, two elements, and this one I'll break down into further ones, two elements, and, and put it in two short words, healing and creating. Healing and creating. People that wind up on this line, it seemed like they never really healed. They were hurting, they were wounded, it never really healed. And sometimes the he healing had to do more with just the, than the divorce. There were addictions, there were uh, chemical dependency, a lot of things that went on. And they never healed, and it never got better. Other people healed, they got better, they got back to where they were at before, but they didn't really create any kind of anything new for themselves. Didn't really remake their lives in a way to have it happen differently. And there's nothing particularly wrong with that. I mean, you can go back to life the way it was, um, healing is critical, but they didn't really create a new life. The people here looked at it and said, okay, what can I create for myself going forward that's better than what I have now, maybe even better than what I had before? And that's the creating part. I'm going to spend most of my time on the creating part because it does, believe it or not, we'll get around to the law. It does relate to the law and process choices that you have in terms of helping you create that new life and that new way of looking at things. A lot of the creating part has to do with making decisions. And I want to help you make some decisions. But it's very, very hard to make decisions when you're wounded and when you're, in the, when you're still healing. And most of you are probably at very different places. Sometimes the emotional divorce happens at a different time for people than the legal divorce. And in that way, divorce is unfair. I mean, it really asks you to make important decisions at a time when you're somewhat least capable of doing that. And so I want you to think about the healing part to think about what do I have to do to help myself get ready for the decisions I'm going to have to make. And as a divorce attorney, I can't make that happen. I can only point you in the direction of people and places that might help you do that. And what I've observed from people is sometimes it's just time. Some people heal over time. And so it's, sometimes it's nothing more than that. Other times it's pretty intensive therapy, working with mental health people to help on the healing. 
Sometimes it's couples therapy, even divorce closure stuff. As a couple, be able to talk as a couple about what went on during the marriage. Sometimes it's just support of friends who really support you in the process. Sometimes it's places like this that help in the healing. Whole variety of things that happen. Sometimes, you know, one of the things that comes up sometimes, people say, what about, you know, people don't really bring it up this way, but revenge. I want to get, you know, it, I'm hurting. I want this person to suffer. I mean, again, people often don't want to describe it that way, but I think that's part of what's going on. It feels like if only he knew what he did to me and how unfair he's been to me, then I would feel better. And in truth, there may be a short-term relief in that, but it is in observing people, and I've seen a lot of people go through the court system thinking that, boy, if nothing else, I'm going to make him see that what he did was wrong. I've talked to many, many people who went into the process that way. I haven't talked to a single person who came out thinking, boy, that felt better. It felt better for a moment when your lawyer said, called him on what he did or this or that. It held it, oh, great, we, we got after him. Didn't feel good in the end because it never got you the healing that you wanted. Um, you know, there's an old saying that the best, living well is the best revenge. And if there's any sense of revenge, this is your chance to do it. Go out and live the best life you can. That's the only kind of revenge I've ever seen work in a divorce context. But when we're talking about healing, we're really talking about being able to take care of, respect whatever wound that you have, respect it, nurture it, take care of it. Uh, again, for some of you, there may be very little of this. Some of you may be a big gaping hole, but whatever it is, respect it. You're not to blame for it. You didn't cause it, you didn't create it, but it's there. And if you don't respect it, you're not going to get to the creating part. You're going to be too much hurting to really be able to do that. The uh, part I want to spend my time on is creating. How do you create that new life in a way that's going to help you get, get to here? Um, and I'll break that down into three parts, actually kind of four, but there's two subparts. And, and the first part is planning. Second part is getting the knowledge, information you need. And the third part is getting help, getting some help, getting some professionals to help you. Um, and just in a quick summary, the planning part, that's kind of the goal saying, figure out where you want to go. The knowledge part, that's where I'll talk about a little bit about the law, what's the law say? And what are the choices within the law? How do I go about divorce? What are my choices for going about divorce? We'll spend most of our time probably on that. And then the, the, uh, the last part is professionals. Who do I get to help me with this? You know, mediators, lawyers, counselors. Who do, you know, how do I find people to help me? Because it's, I don't want to do this alone. So you know, what do I mean by planning? Because you know, to some extent, you probably already plan. So I want to get, I'm going to hire this person. I'm going to get done. And I'm going to get this amount of support and blah, blah, blah. That's not the kind of planning I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about really high-level visioning stuff. I'm really talking about getting a picture of your life as it looks 5 and 10 and 20 years from now. And what does it look like? What's your best vision of your life? 15, 20 years from now, the things that I get from people when they look at life on the other side of this big bridge, boy, you know, my, my kids did well, they got through it all, we co-parented well, they really came through this, uh, got through school, uh, we're healthy adults, uh, we're able to form good relationships. I moved on with my life, with my career, if I was in a career, or with, with staying home with the kids. I was able to form new relationships. I had a good relationship with my ex-spouse, at least a functional one. Um, I really got better with finances than I used to be. Boy, I had trouble with finances, but I got better at it, really built a good, stable economic future for myself. And boy, I'm happier now than I've ever been, because I took care of all those things. Um, that's the kind of vision. What does it look like in terms of how your kids do, how you do, how you do yourselves, what your career is, how you, even your own sense of dignity. I got through this with some sense of dignity, some privacy. Those are the big picture items. So, you know, to try to have that vision of what it looks like, because we want to design a divorce plan for you that allows you to achieve those high level things. This isn't about getting the case settled. You're all going to get the case settled somewhere. 95% of all cases settle, and that's great. I want to get it settled sooner rather than later, but I want you to reach a settlement that gets you, you know, get you on that next level. Second piece is, and this is kind of more one breaks into two part knowledge. And if I look at creating, you know, using the metaphor again, if I were building a building, say, okay, first I need the plan. We talk about that. I need a plan. What kind of building am I going to build? Well, then that second, I need the knowledge. I need to know how to do this. And I've never built a building before. I've never been through a divorce. What's the knowledge? And the, and that's I'm a divorce lawyer. That's why part of me here is to give you some of that knowledge. Um, and the knowledge, I'm going to break into two areas. There's knowledge about the law and knowledge about the process, meaning how do I do it? The law is, okay, what are the rules, which is the law part, and then what is the process to help me get done? I want to give you a quick overview of the law. 
so that you at least understand a little bit what the general parameters are and just a way of looking at it so that you have an idea about it. We could, it would take me 10 hours to try to describe all the divorce laws, but I just want to give you a quick overview. And when you talk about the law in divorce, there are, we've got a list we send out to people and a lot of lawyers do. They say, well, here are the issues in your divorce. And the list is usually like 50 some things. I mean, there's everything from tax exemptions to this to that. And it's sort of overwhelming. And those are, to stand out for a reason, there's a lot of things to think about. But for simplicity, I would put them all in the three categories. The first category is parenting. Um, what are we going to do about our kids? What are we going to do about where they're going to spend their time? How are we going to make decisions about their lives? Uh, how are we going to do it? And, and there's labels we'll, put, we'll talk about later, uh, custody and blah, blah, blah. But I want to talk about the kids. Right now, the number one, the first set of issues is what's going to happen with the kids? Where are they going to spend their time? How are we going to make their decisions? Uh, how are we going to parent these children? Second grouping is um, what I'll call, and lawyers call, property, but it's really a broader description than that. By property, we mean the house, the car, the pensions, the stuff, the things in the house. Even the debts are considered part of property, when, the way lawyers talk about it, because it's sort of an offset of the stuff. But basically, it's how are we going to divide what we have? You know, how do we going to, you know, you've got some stuff, I get some stuff, he gets some stuff, how do we divide that? That's property, that's a whole set of categories. And that's actually of the three, usually the easiest of the three, but um, we'll come back to that. And the third category, and again, I'll use the broad general terms, is just cash flow. Cash flow. How do we take our incomes and make two homes work? Whether we call it child support or alimony or just call it sharing expenses. If we're if this is going to get done, we've got to make sure my home works and I've got to make sure his home works or he's not going to agree to this. So that's cash flow. How do we make the cash support two homes, which is often one of the most economically difficult. If you're like most American couples, you've lived on all of your incomes up until now and now you've got to have those same incomes generate two households first go around that looks like an impossible problem. Well, there's ways to solve that, but that's the cash flow piece. First with custody. And the custody the law divides into two categories. There's kind of a legal type of custody and a physical custody. And legal custody is the one that has to do with how, chill, how you make the decisions. How do we decide where they go to school? How do we decide what, uh, where they go to the doctor? How do we decide what church they go to or synagogue? That's legal custody, it's decision making. Physical custody is kind of, kind of how we allocate the time, but how we control the day-to-day -day life. And that's usually the big one, the physical custody, where they're gonna spend their time. Um, and with the legal custody, it's kind of the easy one from a legal standpoint. And people always say, well, we want joint custody. Well, what is joint custody? Well, there's joint legal custody and there's joint physical custody. Joint legal custody happens in probably 95% of all cases, at least on paper. The law presumes that the two of you can make decisions about medical care and, and, reli and uh, religion and schooling together just as you have in the past. Joint physical custody sort of implies but doesn't really mean that you share equal time. When people say joint physical custody, they usually think it means 50-50. The law doesn't exactly say that. It says joint physical, I've seen joint physical custody arrangements where one parent has the children 70% of the time and the other 30%. Um, the law is ambiguous about what it means. It does mean some kind of sharing of time in sort of a 50-50 way. So when most people use it, they think joint physical means something like 50-50 time. So that one relates to the amount of time people spend together. Now the other piece that the law tells you is what if we can't agree on custody and the court has to decide? What will the court do? Will it give it to me, give it, give it to my husband? You know, it would take hours to explain, but basically the bottom line is what the law says is the judge would have to do what's in the best interest of your children if he or she can figure that out. And, and there's 13 different factors, but it's, you know, best interest of your children. Well, that's it's good in a way because it ought to be based on the best interest of children, but it's not exactly telling you what the answer is because if you're in a dispute about custody, it's because you both think something different is best for your children. And so it doesn't exactly answer the question. The thing I'll use to demonstrate this um, in terms of, and this kind of goes to our process choices, but if a judge has to decide custody, um, here's what, and this, I've seen judges use this as well. Let's say this piece of paper represents everything about your parenting at your home. Your parenting, your husband's parenting, all represent on this piece of paper. Okay, of all the things that represent your home, this now represents the things you remember. A lot of stuff you forget. Nobody remembers everything. Okay, so you go into your lawyer's office and you tell them everything you can remember. You don't, can't get everything. You don't have time to cover it all. So this is how much you tell your lawyer. Tell them that much of it. Okay? Lawyer's not going to pick up all of it, not going to understand all of it, not going to remember all of it. So this is how much the lawyer remembers. Okay? 
We go to trial, the judge lays it out. This is how much that the lawyer can say to the judge, because there's really rules of admi admissibility. You only get a day, you get about at most this much. So this is how much the judge remembers or cares about. And if I could scrunch it one more time, I would show you how much the judge can really rely upon in making the decision. But the bottom line is, this is the information that the judge uses to decide the future of your children, not the big piece of paper, this little piece of paper. And any good judge will tell you that. It's not because the judge is bad or they're wrong. They don't get the stuff. They don't have the information you do. The people that ought to decide about your parenting of your kids are you and your husband. They're the ones with the information, and we need to find ways to do that. On the property piece, and again, property means everything, houses, pensions, you know, everything you own. Typically, the, the main thing you need to know is the law divides things into two, all properties in one of two categories. It's either marital or it's non-marital. And those are words that, I mean, basically, well, basically here's what they mean in simple English. Marital property is anything that you acquired during the marriage through work that was either done by you or by your spouse. Doesn't matter which of you did the work, doesn't matter whose name it's in, doesn't matter who wanted to buy the, the piece of property, it's marital if you both earned it. It's not his pension, it's not your pension, it's the marital. If it was earned during the marriage, it belongs to the marital estate and probably gets divided equally. I mean, the loss is equity, we'll use that means equally, but anything you both earned during the marriage belongs to you. And we get a lot of couples who come in and say, well, we've always kept it separate. We always kept my stuff here and his stuff here. And, and you can do that if you wish, but the law doesn't say that. I don't care how separate you kept it. If it earned during the marriage, it's half yours and half his. And, and, and that sometimes, most people understand that sometimes people have trouble seeing that. They think, well, it's his pension. No, it's not. It's your pension. You know, it belongs to the marriage. The non-marital property is anything that either you had from before the marriage that you can still trace to an asset. You, you know, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute. Or a gift or an inheritance that you received that you can trace to an asset. So what that means, if you had you know, 30,000 in a bank account with the time you were married and you still have it today and it's in that same bank account, you probably get to keep that without any questions, without, without it even being balanced. You know, it's a little bit more you know, complicated than that. There's income generated on it. But for the most part, if you had it before the marriage and you can still identify it, you get it. If you spent it, it's gone, too bad. I mean, even, and what's unfair about the law, if you start with strict law, if you had 30,000 in an account, your husband had 30,000 in an account, he saved his, you spent yours during the marriage, technically under the law, he keeps his, your 30's gone. Now again, if that's what the hard level of the law is, a lot of times when people mediate or collaborate, they come up with a different result, but that's what they mean by marital or non-marital. Inheritance, same thing, if you inherited money, if you put it into the house, you can get more of the house equity. There are formulas and things that would decide that. But if you've got some inheritance that you can trace to the house or some bank account, that would go to you or to your husband. Same thing as with a gift. If a gift was intended, and it's usually a gift from outside the marriage, not gifts to each other, um, that was intended just for you, then you get that as your non-marital. And it gets complicated because sometimes your parents might have given $10,000 to help you buy your first house. Was that a gift to you or to the two of you? And that's what we'd have to kind of sort out. If it was to you, it's non-marital. If it was to you as a couple, it's marital. The third and last legal piece before we talk about process is uh, what we'll call cash flow. And I purposely use cash flow rather than child support and alimony, even though it often means that, just because it's better to think in terms of the broader category. This is, you know, determine who pays what to whom, or how do we handle the expenses in the home? But there are formulas for child support, and you can use formulas, don't have to. Sometimes people, if they have even custody, even incomes, they just decide who's going to pay which expenses, or how we're going to divide the expenses evenly, or we'll put the money in the account and do it this way. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but child support can be by guidelines, or it can be just based on looking at the needs of the children and how we allocate those. Alimony, and what, what most case st states call alimony, we call spousal maintenance, but it means the same thing, is probably one of the least predictable part of our law. I mean, if, I, if, if any of you are in an alimony or maintenance situation and you were to give me the facts, I could find the best, 10 best lawyers in town, present the same facts to them, and probably get 10 slightly different answers. We don't have guidelines on alimony. We don't have exact formulas. What we have are general parameters, and the parameters are this. If the first part is if one of you lacks the capacity to be self-supporting. That's the first part. Can you, can you be self-supporting? And the other one has the ability to help in your support, meaning the other person has the ability to provide their support and the ability to help you 
then there's likely to be some sort of alimony. So if there's, and, and in short, if there's a big difference in incomes, yeah, probably going to be, you know, if somebody makes two or three times what the other one makes, there's likely to be some alimony. Um, within the alimony or spousal maintenance, there's a lot of other variables, the main ones being how much, how long, and how variable. And the how much is usually depend, dependent on budgets. What's it going to take for his home to survive? What's it going to take for your home? What are the relative incomes that each of you have? And we look at budgets. The law says to stay in the marriage, standard living during a marriage, however, sometimes that's not possible because you have the same income supporting two houses. But to try to look at budgets, looking at it that way, that's how you look at how much. And usually we'd just break down budgets and incomes to figure that out. Um, the how long, law breaks it into two categories. There's permanent alimony and there's temporary rehabilitative. Um, like a lot of things in the law, the words aren't what they seem. Permanent is not as permanent as it sounds and temporary is not as temporary as it sounds. Uh, but what they mean is permanent alimony or permanent maintenance means until the death of either party or the remarriage of the spouse or until a substantial change of circumstances. So it could be forever, but it probably would end upon retirement or remarriage. But it would at least be throughout the rest of the earning years and sometimes beyond that. And in longer marriages, 20 years or more, typically that's what we would look at as permanent. The idea of permanent alimony is that one spouse has made sacrifices, is not able to support himself or herself, and is probably never going to catch up. There's not enough years for them to catch up. They're never going to really become self-supporting, so we make it permanent. Temporary rehabilitative is more shorter marriages. One spouse is behind the other spouse, either because they made sacrifices during their marriage or for other reasons, and they need some time to catch up. Maybe they need to go back to school and finish their education. Maybe they just need to get back in the workforce to do that. And so they do it for a number of years, two years, five years, 10 years, um, whatever it takes to become self-supporting. If you sit down in a problem-solving standpoint and looking for high-level goals, there are a lot of creative ways to deal with this issue that can really be kind of win-wins for everybody. So if you do some planning, there's some things you can do with the cash flow numbers that really, in a, in a good case, if the two of you plan together, you can probably come out with more dollars than the judge would give either one of you or give the two of you together if you're planning together. And that's the main thing to take out of that is, yeah, there are formulas, but the biggest formula is what does your family need? What are the real needs of your family? You know, start from the idea that most cases settle somewhere on the continuum from the most informal to the most formal. And so I'll, on, starting on this end of the continuum, which is the most informal method, that's you and your husband working out a lot of stuff on your own. That's the most informal. We call it kind of the kitchen table method. The two of you working out at least some of the issues on your own. A lot of people do some of this. Very few do all of it that way, but this is one end of the continuum. The other end of the continuum, way over on this end, and still staying within my little tape here, is uh, that...